It's the Conf Lab. It means an intimate or private discussion or conversation. This is season two of my podcast, The Conf Lab. And from wherever you are, whether you are ironing a shirt or playing in the dirt, we're just stoked to have your ears and actually now your eyes. <laughs> We've gone to video. Yay. I love being on camera. <laughs> Someone said to me, you have, a, you have a face for radio and a voice for silence. So <laughs> I don't mind. Thank you. Um, yeah, so we're just happy to have you here. This season's about resilience and it's one of my um, absolute favourite topics, resilience, because I think it's been – like it's a buzzword, you know. You get all these these words in society, they're, they're buzzwords and people anchor into these words. But it is actually a very favourite topic of mine because I've had to actually learn what resilience really is, you know, strengthen in the battle for the battle. And – but it's, it basically just means your ability to bounce back to normal. It means that no matter what's face, whatever you're facing and you'll be going through something, whether it be grief, trauma, pain, uh, physical adversity, uh, if you're an elite athlete, whatever it is, uh, it's your ability to bounce back to normal. So like if you're an athlete, for instance, or, or not even an athlete, just, just normal training, your fitness is – displayed by your ability to bring your heart rate back down to a normal resting heart rate as quick as possible. So, if you know, you're spiking your heart rate out at 180 or something like that. It's true physical resilience is your ability to bring it right back to uh, your resting heart rate quickly. Now, I know I repeated that twice, but I wanted to make a point there. Um, psychological resilience is the ability to cope mentally and emotionally with a crisis or a turn and return to pre-crisis status quickly. That's what psychological or emotional resilience is. So why talk on resilience this season? Well, I believe it's what we need to have a thriving life. And I believe that it's um, misappropriated in society. It's not – we don't anchor into – we use the word a lot, but do we actually do the action? And that, you know, the difference between knowing something and having it come out of here, out of your heart, means means really this is what this is what it takes, this is what I know. And I know a, a lot of shit, but it doesn't mean I activate it all properly in my heart. So um, having resilience in your heart and in and all these things. We're just going to go through a few things, but I've got a fable I want to – actually talk uh, a fable I want to talk about quickly. I'll tell you a story. It's called The Farmer, the Well and the Donkey and it's a story of resilience. So this farmer had a well and his donkey fell in the well and he threw down a rope and he tried everything he could but the donkey was way too heavy to pull out uh, the well. And so the, the, the farmer thought, well, look, the donkey's old and this well it actually really needs to go because it's not safe. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go and campaign to my neighbours and get them all to help me. He'll do a working bee. And we'll just fill the, fill the well in and goodbye to the donkey. So here they all are, digging dirt, throwing dirt down the hole and the donkey's like getting dirt laying on his back and he's, he's crying out and screaming out and carrying on and hooting and hurrying until eventually he started to quieten down and they all stopped and heard what was, saw what was going on and the farmer appeared over the edge of the, of the well and saw that as the dirt was falling on the donkey's back, he was shaking it off and then standing on that mound of dirt. And he, this continued the whole time until he was able just to hop out of the, out of the well and, and run off. So the moral to this story is there will be times when life just shovels dirt on us. It is within our capacity to decide whether or not life's dirt pins us down or lifts us up. The reality of life is that challenges, hardships, stress, trauma do occur. Be it a breakup, be it a loss of a job, be it the loss of a loved one or a friend or their passing or whatever else it is, there's no way around it. Life is full of difficulties. So what we do as human beings 
is the ability to express and process our emotions and to grieve, learn, grow from adverse events. In doing so, every setback we overcome has the capacity to teach us how to cope better down the line, and that's resilience. So that's the end of that little moral, that little story, but it it's highlights the fact that we're strengthened through the battle, for the battle, and we need to be aware of that. As I so often see people who, who are tired after a fight and tired after a battle and, and worn out and don't take the lessons on, don't take the process on properly and it doesn't form the resilience they're going to need for what's coming next. And I love this word, vicissitudes of life, which just basically means ebbs and flows, but they're going to be there. And without uh, resilience, we're not going to thrive through them. We're not going to be able to to focus down and and look at life from a different perspective than this everything is always against me. So resilience will take us into a place of gratitude where without it, will take us into a place of victimization. Like it's always happening to me. This is not fair. I don't know what to do about it rather than being resilient and looking for the lessons in each thing and growing from that thing. And I've got a great story about a, a guy called by, by the name of Mo Gaudet. And I'm going to close, pretty well close this episode with that. But before I get too far into that, I just want to talk quickly about there's a Harvard University study around resilience in kids and how it's obtained. And uh, there will be in the show notes. And look, like it's a, there's a lot of words in there, so I'm not actually going to read it all. Um, but they basically have found that what creates resilience – in a child, so he can handle, sorry, not he, they can handle the adverse effects of life no matter what it be, whether it be bullying in school or whether it be a loss of a parent or whether it be whatever adverse effects come against a child when they're young, they found that two different categories and one is the ones with resilience had a supportive parent, mentor or person, supportive and understanding and the ones that didn't have a supporting parent or, you know, person or mentor in their life, they struggled more without resilience. So it's just an interesting fact and it's right there and there's these four key factors that kids need to obtain resilience. So I will read them out. One, number one, facilitating supportive adult-child relationships. So it's an adult-child relationship. And so if you're looking at it from a from an older perspective, it's a, an older mentor, younger mentor perspective. So cultivating and facilitating a supportive relationship in that area. Number two, building a sense of self-efficacy and perceived control, which means be- building a belief in you that you got this. Self-efficacy means, hey, I, I, I believe in myself. I have no self-doubt here. And even though doubts will come, I'm going to thank that doubt for being there, but I don't, I don't believe that about myself. Uh, number three is providing opportunities to strengthen, adapt skills and self-regulate capacities. So that's like being able to have that all on yourself rather than expecting an outside source to do that for you. And the fourth one was mobilizing sources of faith, hope and cultural traditions. So we get all these from our elders, again, coming back to number one, facilitating supportive relationships from a mentor perspective. So they're the four things that the Harvard University found. That whole study's there if you want to listen to it. But the main thing I want to talk about now is just some of my own stuff and some of my own perspective and my own life here, or my understanding and, you know, my wisdom, what I've actually had to go through, is we need resilience in balance. You know, we need to balance it. So if you look at how a person's made up with body, mind and spirit. So we have our physical side, our, our spiritual side uh, and our soul uh, and we also have our emotional side and some people would say there's maybe four but I'm just going to work on those three. And so often we don't balance resilience in all of those but it needs to happen. And so if you look at it like the ba- there's a thing called a the barrel theory, right? It's like a wine barrel and our capacity as a human can only ever come to the lowest formed plank so if you look at an old wine barrel and it's being put together and you've got some planks all the way up to the top and some don't come all the way up to the top 
then that's the one we have to work on. So that might be your emotional plank in your barrel, and but your physical plank is all the way to the top. Or maybe it's your spiritual plank that's all the way to the top and your physical one's all the way to the bottom. We need to work our capacity as a person to be able to handle life's adverse events is only ever going to be at the lowest plank. So I know that makes sense. Um, so then that's the work. That's The work's there. And and so often, you know, we see it like with our, with our sportsmen, especially here in Australia, where they're elite sportsmen, they achieve a phenomenal things, they're at the top of their game, especially right now. We've just had both AFL and NRL grand finals complete and they're all in their mad Mondays and they're tearing up, having a lot of fun. But are they acting out of a resilient maturity? And I'm not saying they're not because I, I, I wouldn't dare judge. But so often we see sportsmen that fail with their emotions that they can't handle things because they've worked so hard on their physical resilience but never done anything about their emotional resilience. Or we see so often we might see spiritual gurus and quite often whether it be a church person or whether it be a Muslim or whatever faith that you have, no matter what faith it is or what belief it is, we might have a spiritual guru in that area. And spiritually, they're amazing. Like spiritually, they can teach us anything, like any at all. Like if you look at a Jewish rabbi, they can teach you the Quran, they can teach you the first five books of the Bible. They've got it all up here. And they can teach you everything like that, but they not, might not be physically resilient to be able to handle a physical test. And so what I'm saying about this balance, this resilience and balance is – we need to work on all of it. It's a holistic thing. We need to be emotionally, spiritually, and physically healthy to be able to handle all adverse effects on life. And how do we get that? You know, we go back to what Harvard said about having a supportive person in our life. And I agree with that. I absolutely 100% do because I do that and it's made a difference in my world. So that's the example of an, like I would say, of an imbalanced or out of balanced resilience is where we have our barrel and one of those planks is low and we need to work on that plank to get them all level. So just moving on, I just want to talk now about this guy I was saying earlier, Mo Cordette. I've just recently listened to a podcast with him and he's the happiness guy. Um, he's on a mission to, I don't know, how many millions of people he wants to affect with happiness. Uh, and it, where it came from. But what I want to do is talk about where it came from. So Mo Cordette used to be the CEO of Google X and he had all the money in the world and had a great marriage, had two beautiful kids and just a really smart person and very resilient, uh, really switched on person. And his son died uh, on the operating table from an appendicitis and it shouldn't have happened. It was an easy procedure but there was five mistakes that happened and his son died. And his son, I'm not sure what age he was, might have been in early 20s. And the last couple of years his son was teaching his dad about happiness and about this message of everyone deserves to be happy. Everyone deserves the same opportunities and to be happy. And when he died, his father his father. Mo changed his whole story from what he was doing to this. He realized that the death – and no one should ever bury a child. And it's the toughest thing. I, I, watched my, I watched my grandmother at my father's funeral say she should never have to bury a son. And I've watched – recently I've watched another very dear friend who lost her son to mental illness have to bury her child. And it was a very tough thing and no one should have to bury their children. However, what he did was he took his son's mission on and his son, while he was alive, might have only affected, say, say he was really successful at what it did. He may have affected, say, 10,000 people. That would be huge. That would be massive. I mean, it would, be, it would be phenomenal if he reached that far. But because of what his father's influence was and his father wanted to get his message out everywhere, instead of meandering in the pain and, and I'm like, no, I shouldn't say meandering, but instead of suffering in the pain and the grief of a loss, which he did, he actually took the message on and now I think they've reached 51 million people who have actually signed up for their program, the happiness program. And I will have the actual program in the show notes so you guys can check that out. But 51 million people. And 
he decided I'm going to be resilient in this this adverse thing that's uh, that's just attacked me. And I would say that Mo is resilient in a perfect balance of those things. Now he's he would say he's not perfect, and I wouldn't say he is either. But what I'm saying is to be able to do what he has done because of that, because of the situation, and take the story out. There's definitely a resilience there, and one of the 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 his son had a tattoo on his back, and so I'm going to finish with this. And the tattoo said, "The gravity of the battle means nothing to those who are at peace." Wow, that is an incredible statement. The gravity of the battle means nothing to those who are at peace. It means you're going to be going through the battle, but the gravity of it means nothing to those who are at peace, which is that's a resilient statement. So, okay, I can handle this. This is not going to knock me. This is not going to change me from displaying my values, my love for people, my compassion. See, I would say that uh, a, not a very resilient attitude would be if something knocks you and immediately you lose it. But having a resilient attitude to everything that comes your way is this can't change me. This can change my outside circumstances, but this can't change me. Only I can change me. And so I hope you all got something from that today. Um, looking forward to this season uh, with resilience. I've got some incredible guests coming on. First being my personal coach, uh, Brett Robinson, who's a, a seasoned podcaster. But more than that, he's just an incredible human being. And I'm looking forward to... Getting more, I've got a great, second, our second guest is a great midwife and she's a resilient woman with what she's done. And we have a bunch. We've got an ultra marathon runner. We've got a guy who's been to uh, the French Foreign Legion and we've got the happiest man in the universe on too, which is really awesome. So I'm going to check out here. Thanks for tuning in. That was the end of another episode. Thanks so much for tuning in today. If you've enjoyed this episode, I would love for you to rate, review and subscribe as this will help me get my message out to more people. If you've heard anything today that has resonated with you, please feel free to reach out to me on Instagram at Nath Cartledge. All the other ways to contact me will be in the show notes. I'd love to chat and hear your thoughts. Can't wait to Conflab next week. 